Welcome to the Evolving Spiritual Practice podcast. I'm Ralph Cree. This is brought to you in association with bodyheartmindspirits.co.uk. Today I talked to Gary Hawke about spiritual exercise. Um, in the Western tradition, we <clears throat> tend to view exercise as just a kind of bodily based thing we do and that the only spiritual type of exercise there is is yoga and um, today Gary and I explored that any type of exercise can be a yogic activity so the two types of exercise in particular we explored were strength training and long distance running which are um, two so Gary does long distance running I don't but we both share a passion for strength training which is something we've both done for <clears throat> a long time many years and we go into quite a lot of subtle nuance about the art of exploring who we are through exercise and not just exploring our bodies but exploring our emotions uh, the contractions we have around uh, discomfort uh, and expansion and how exhaustion um, and consciously turning into uh, turning towards and leaning into discomfort can uh, make us collide with the infinite um, so I really love this conversation it's the first time I've actually uh, explored my love of of, uh, of exercise in this particular way and I think it was the same for Gary um, so it was it was a new thing for us and um, I hope you enjoy it and may it benefit you uh, particularly useful for people that may have been doing some type of exercise like going to the gym for a particular period of time and feel like they've hit a wall with um, their motivation and wondering why they're doing this in the first place um, this is an infinite game and there's uh, layers and layers and layers and layers to it. And the opportunity that's available for you is to discover so much more about who you are um, through something as simple as doing pull-ups and push-ups and running long distances. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, Gary Hawke, welcome back to Evolving Spiritual Practice podcast, interview number two. Very yeah. nice to see you again. You too. When you hit 50, um, you put some photos up on Facebook. Mm. And at that point, I think you'd been reading a lot of books and <laughs> sitting in a chair a lot. And you felt like you even put some selfies up on Facebook of your, your body. And we're like, I'm, I'm 50. Mm. I don't feel very happy with my body as it is um you know going to do something about it watch this space and then i mean i don't know how many how long after it was it was like maybe a couple of years after that you put up some more photos and i just it was a massive transformation it was one of those transformations like you see in uh you know newspapers or, or something it was it was a mm -hmm. you 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 suddenly had the physique of a 20 year old um you know and and you I know you did a, a ton of running and strength training and that you earlier on in your life, as we discussed in our last conversation, you, you did a lot of strength training uh, as a young person, but then there's this kind of point in the middle of your life where you probably didn't do so much of it, but um, that was really striking. And when I saw, I, I really, really find it so, again, this is an extrinsic motivation for me. When I see people like you do what you did, I think, wow, you know, that's, that's possible. You know, it's, it's not just something this, I know this person, they've transformed their body into something amazing um, rather than it just be something I've seen on a website or that kind of thing. That's interesting because I didn't see it as a transformation. Hmm. Oh, that's, so that's the kind of the, the general word in the cult, the culture, isn't it? Trans yeah, it is. Transformation. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. It is. I didn't see it like that. I, I, I saw it as, as a kind of like a Michelangelo thing where I was just revealing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
revealing a, 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 the, the natural state of your body. Yeah, yeah because it's, I mean, it, it just seemed, well, there's a, cause a, there's a couple of reasons, because I'd done a lot of strength training when I was younger, I, I always had this knowledge that if I just went back to that kind of structure, then that muscle memory would kick back in again. But it was a sense in which I just wanted to go back to a point in my body's existence where it didn't have that much fat. And I, I, did, I don't like the term transform. Not in, in how you, it's, I don't like the transform because it feels too much like not being me. And I was still me and it was yeah. still me. And it, all I was doing is just burning calories off. <laughs> I, was really, I find it really difficult because it's, it's all I did. I just burnt calories off. You know, I do find it, I, I, I do get quite challenged within myself when I start to try and um, deconstruct what I did or demystify what I did. I just burnt calories <laughs> off. Yeah. But, but it, 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 it took an, it, obviously, well, I know it takes an enormous amount of discipline um, to do that. And I think, I think discipline, again, a bit of a problematic term because, you know, as you're saying, you just did it. You know, for, for you, it's yeah. just like, oh, that's <laughs> just what I was doing. It's but, do. yeah. yeah. But, yeah. you know, some people really struggle with discipline. And one of the sort of paradoxes about discipline is that it is the pathway to freedom that you know, if I think about the, the music analogy you have this kind of if you put the work in and you're disciplined about your practice practicing scales and technique and all that stuff the freedom that brings to your ability to play is is, is enormous you don't otherwise you'd just be relying on your natural innate musical talent for example so with, if you think about it with the, with the exercising stuff, if, you put, if you're disciplined about putting the work in, the result of that is freedom in your body. Um, mm. and, and also it frees up, as we hopefully explore in a minute, subtle energies and also this causal dimension too in ourselves. That, yeah. I think it's to do, I think it may be to do with how I see, oh, I get it. It's how it's how the word discipline lands for me that I think I struggle with, mm. which is a, a, a kind of behavior modification that's imported from somewhere else, like being disciplined for talking in class, or and I and I, and I think it's also because I spent so long working in prisons where I experienced tremendous amounts of discipline that I didn't, I wasn't disciplined so much as I created rituals that I stepped into. And that I then had to think about what was necessary for me to be able to step into that ritual. So the ritual would be things like, um, a run would be four o'clock in the morning. That's it. And I would then have to work out what was necessary and sufficient for me to be able to step into the discipline, the ritual of four o'clock in the morning. And then that four o'clock in the morning run would be 30 miles. So the next question would be, if the ritual is four o'clock in the morning, it's 30 miles, what's necessary and sufficient for me to be present to that four o'clock in the morning for 30 miles? And that became the process that I did. It, it almost became quite scientific in a sense, as opposed to having to discipline myself in a kind of sense of going to do this, that kind of, oh, it was more of this space exists. I, what do I need to do to step into it? Mm. And it's still the same thing. There's a space exists today. I might have to move it around, but it's a space that I will step into at some point today for an hour. Mm. And it won't become a discipline to do it. It's just that's what's in the space. Like when I come into this room, that's what's in this room. 
it's it's removing the kind of constraints around it just to accept it as a present thing all the time. With, yeah, discipline is quite a a, a nuanced t word. I mean, it, it, it discipline, disciple, learning. You know, they, they, there's a kind of constant. It's the root of the word is to do with learning, and to learn. There's something. So when I work out or do any exercise, I feel like I'm. I'm learning more. I'm revealing more about the reality of myself, um, the phenomenal phenomenology of my experience. I'm I'm unearthing more of my internal dimension, more sensations in my body, uh, learning more about my body, about my capacities, about my mind, um, how to work with sensations and <clears throat> pleasant sensations and um, and painful sensations and there's a, there's a difference between that and somebody who just gets up and i'm not saying this is what you're saying but the somebody that get that goes to the tr they go to the gym like three days a week they know it's like when monday wednesday thursday i get on the treadmill I put on a te I put on a podcast or I watch the news channel and I just do my exercise and I'm not actually learning anything there. It's just literally just the act, and there's no mutuality or even any participation or inquisitiveness about that act. It's just I just go do the act and I don't really engage with it. Is, is that? Am I making sense? Yeah, it's, between the it is. But it, yeah, it's interesting because I, I, I get I get the distinction. Yet at the same time, I'm wondering whether or not there's something about. I, I go back to the idea of the transcendence in it that, that there, there's something that it's the notion of retreating into the transcendent in the space to learn more. So we do the same thing. Let's let's propose I'm doing the same thing. I get up. Get up at four o'clock in the morning, I go on a treadmill. So there's somebody else gets up at four o'clock when I get in the treadmill. But when I get on the treadmill, I'm getting on the treadmill or whatever it is, so I'm doing resistance band work or whatever. I'm doing it as a retreat into my consciousness so I can transcend. And to do that, I'm allowing myself to become vast and really exploring what's taking place for me in each rep, in each breath between each rep, thinking about what's the best way of planning this process. I am completely in the moment of a creative act of being with myself through expanding the limits of myself. So I'm fully driving into myself and fully retreating into myself. So I'm doing no different from the person on the treadmill running, listening to music, we're both retreating but they're retreating away from themselves and I'm retreating into myself. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, you know, one of the things that is talked a lot about in spiritual practice is transvert transcendence and then the opposite imminence or, you know, so mm. transcendence being going out and away from and the op imminence being going into and inside and, mm. um, and they're, they're kind of two poles either positive and negative or or something and i think people have a natural tendency towards one or the other but when it comes to exercise it's the the intensity of the sensations you feel that that kind of make you want to transcend them uh it's, it's like and it I think it teaches you about, so if I was, one different definition of what's called the ego um, would be that part of yourself that contracts in the face of intensity, whether it's intense pleasure or intense discomfort. And so one of the things that has become a real feature of my 
workouts is becoming curious and learning about this part of myself that contracts in the face of that. And, and I'll also come to uh, become more familiar with the part of myself, which is, is totally uncontracted in the face of, uh, you know, these intense sensations. And so that every time I work out, there's this opportunity to expand myself, like you were saying, into and out and out out of at the same time. That um, give an example of that happening simultaneously. So I, I I don't do a lot of running because I, it hurts my knees. I've got some an injury from rugby when I was younger. Um, but when I'm always I, I love very simple techniques for encountering our own formless awareness uh, for want of a better term and running delivers it very intuitively and directly that when you are running we we kind of we, we're in the western tradition um we're we kind of taught to believe that we are a little body running through three-dimensional space mm. but you can actually completely turn that around when you're running and feel that you aren't moving and what is moving a bit like playing a vr game virtual reality game what is moving is the world the virtual reality world if you're doing a virtual reality game you've got a headset on and you're just standing in a room you might be running in the game but you're not going anywhere and so when i was jogging or um, or sprinting i could t turn it around 180 degrees and feel like i was eating the world so to speak it was just coming towards me and inside my formless awareness and just disappearing and so that's like was like a very direct and simple way a bit like douglas harding's headlessness exercises mm -hmm. of realizing that that it, um and then at the same time, because I, had, I was experiencing that spaciousness inside myself that is totally uncontracted, is never contracted in any moment, um, I had more space and less fear around letting the intense physical sensations occupy that space inside myself. So both things were happening at the same time that makes sense yeah it does it's um it, it's interesting i i, I like that the, the headless the idea of headless run hmm. the, um, i think what do i it, i i think for me running is not it's not running that's, I don't think it's the running that's the issue for me in the sense of the practice. I think running for me is the act of breathing. Hmm. That it's to feel into the notion of how the breath sits when the body moves into that kind of lactic threshold. And I, I've, so I, I trained as a British athletics running coach because I wanted to, I had this idea of setting up a, a sort of project. And so I could legitimize myself. I trained as, as a coach. And one of the things I discovered in the training of a coaching is very much about situating a goal outside oneself that one can get to, to keep moving towards, to keep the running going. And at no point did any of the training talk about the idea of running as a form of stillness, as a form of meditative practice, as a form of being in flow with oneself in breath and movement. It was very much about running a certain distance, uh, running for a charity, but it was never about just running for the sake of being with oneself and noticing how oneself exists 
that just ne never appeared. Well, I know that what's added now is kind of people will talk about running that's a mindfulness practice, but even that, it still feels like it's missing what running is, which is an opportunity to really be in your own breath. And I think that for me is that, that that's the subtle body running. Mm. It's just feeling the flow of the world and the flow of yourself through your breathing and your rhythm and your movement. And really feeling into the capacities of your body and how you how there's got to be a deep relationship to your body because you you've got to you've got to speak to each other. There's got to be the the it's a strange thing, this, but it seems to me that the causal, subtle and gross body have to come into a union to speak to each other while you're in running. Mm. And of all the exercises I've ever done, it feels to me that there's a way of running being a kind of integration of the three bodies. And I've had tremendous, I, I recall one early morning run where I turned the corner and I was running towards St. Paul's and I turned the corner and St. Paul's appeared and I just ceased to be. I couldn't locate myself at all. There was just St. Paul's. And I'd completely lost all location of myself in that moment. And it was profoundly moving, but it was just the fact that I was in a complete state of flow. And just for that instant, lost myself. Because mm -hmm. I was just everywhere it felt like as i turned the corner just felt like i was everywhere and nowhere and i think it's because there's a unity of the bodies there's unity of breath there's unity of flow and that doesn't come through in the whole notion of running that it's an act of unity yeah and uh, another phrase that Matt makes me think of is technique of ecstasy yeah that's a good one yeah um the that that the running is a technology to bring you into that experience of non dualness or flow state mm. where, you, mm. where you become everything. And one thing we haven't touched on is how exhaustion has, uh, you know, many millenniums long tradition of people using exhaustion as a as a as a means to have non-ordinary experiences yeah yeah so you know i'm thinking of uh some of the african spirit possession ceremonies where people dance and play music like all night without stopping um and it's a modern day version of that would be some of the rave culture and you know burning man festival glastonbury festival that kind of thing where something really special happens where you no longer have the biological subtle mental logical strength anymore to contract and then the magic happens it, you know yeah. you, you just you it's like you you just yeah that part of you is is KO'd um and <laughs> I, I the, the times when I experienced it the most was when I was a young younger person playing eighty minute rugby matches or something. Um, the exhaustion I would get into, and the fact it was a team sport as well, I would we'd just become the I would be the team. You know, and it was also it always happened outside in whatever weather, and some you know you get these kind of perfect moments where it might you know st a thunderstorm is brewing. Um, and the team's re working really well. It's towards the end of the match. It's been a very emotional and, and close match, and it's, and it's been exciting. And you just, everybody's given 100%. It's totally spent, and just, you have these incredible, it's, and it, it's, it's very hard to describe. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah you know, it's, it's a non verbal experience. Yeah. So we, we have yeah. to do our best, you know, but yeah. we're pointing at the moon. And, it's own. interesting because in Biscar's philosophy of materiality, he has he has four states of non-dual. One of them is holistic teamwork. Mm. The, he he promotes the sense in which when you're working, like saying when you're working in that space and that team, what happens is that you can 
have that non-dual experience as a team event. As a the the the, the theatre director who wrote towards Paul Theatre Grotowski, he has um, he created these things called the exercise plasties plasties, and they're a set of exercises that are deliberately uh, built to exhaust yourself. And he had this idea that by exhausting yourself, you die to the ego. You, you, you exhaust yourself beyond your capacity to the ego. And what you're left with then is pure sense of self beyond ego, um, which is fine. However, when you're running in a city, that ego death is something you have to be looking at. I, I, have, I have put myself in quite, you know, I've, I've run to a point at which I've gone to exhaustion set, and what tends to happen is, is that I've, I've noticed that I've lost sense of safety. Mm. So I, it, it's, it's the only thing I sometimes wish I could run elsewhere, is that when you're running where there is traffic, you can't really have that kind of ego death because you just suddenly become, you, you don't realize that actually running across that road now in front of that bus is not a good thing to do. Right. And you can, I have done that where I've suddenly had to stop myself because even the bus seems immaterial in a sense. So there is, a, I, I think that that's one of the things I do miss about running in a city that you can't fully move into that non-dual space. Yeah. And even in the parks, you've got bicycles and yeah, you've, there's, there's got to be. I guess, I guess what, I guess, yeah, I suppose what I'm doing is I'm doing my kind of sort of coachy thing by saying it's a really good thing to do. However, don't do it all the time because you could get knocked down. Yeah. Yeah. Just, um, what a safe thing there. I'm still fascinated though about how does it? What is it that happens where? Say somebody goes to the gym or they're doing strength training or they're doing running and they've, they've, they've built their knowledge. What happens, what do they need to look for in moving from training to their knowledge and training to themselves so that they can, they can begin to get a sense of, I don't need somebody else keep telling me what to do. Mm. It, it does look, is there a point at which instinctively we can begin to keep building our knowledge of what we do without feeling that we need a personal trainer? Yeah. Well, I think you know, if I was to use the music analogy, um, that as soon as you start, pick, you pick up your instrument, you start making sounds on it, you are making music. Mm. Even if you need to spend a lot of time learning you know the technique finger positions and do your scales and rudiments and all that stuff and you need a teacher so um and so what you know when you're learning exercise you're, you're learning stuff but at the same time you know a good mentor or teacher of a particular exercise form would say okay well you know, these are the forms of what you need to do that you need to do this number of sets and this is how you do the exercise properly and all that but don't forget to actually enjoy or pay a close attention to what it actually feels like to do this and and you know what you why don't you next time we meet rather than me just tell you stuff why don't you say oh i found when i did whatever uh, this these pull-ups I kind of, you know, it was, it was hurting this part of my body and, and, and I tried it and I was experimenting with different hand positions and, you know, and, and then you're, you're kind of, as a student, you're in a place of mutuality. I think something that you just keep this concept of mutuality just keeps coming up time and time again for me. And it seems to be very much out there in the culture, the conversation the moment about being in, in mutuality, a mutual relationship with your body. So your body's not, a servant it's not this kind of beast that you're riding around on the top of you know you're in mm. conversation and communication and in some re nuanced relationship uh and i think the same has to be the case with your tutors and mentors that you know you're not just passively being told what you're just 
told what to do and you're just receiving information just like a robot you just keep doing it. it's like someone's programmed code into your mind and you just play it out like um did you do i, I when uh, really early on in computing there was this game called i think it was called logo and it just had this turtle and you would put in directional commands and then it would move across the screen it was really exciting <laughs> super basic but i just had this image of that like you go to a teacher they put in the code and then you just go blah, 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 blah. um but what's so if i question myself i i've i i started doing strength training in my when i was 18 and I and all the things I've ever done, all the exercises, all the different forms of exercise I've done, I've never had a teacher. I've never gone to somebody and said, "Teach me this." It, it might be something to do with not liking the the team environment so much, but I just wonder: Have I missed out on something by? not having a personal trainer and if somebody takes on a personal trainer at what point do they develop a relationship with their personal trainer to get rid of their personal trainer yeah well i think uh, a, a a really good teacher is somebody who wants to you to uh, fledge fr from the nest you know to you know, they want to te teach you to fish, not just give you a fish every time you come. You know, it's sort of, I want to get you, get you, give you the tools to just get up and running, but ultimately, you know, I want you to, to find your own way with this. Um, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and but, you know, if we think about this uh, sort of, I'm, I'm, I don't want to cover, I'm, I'm not like super anti-capitalist myself, but um, you know, kind of painting capitalism here in a negative light, but this kind of capitalist version of exercise that um, a lot of people that teach this stuff, they need recurring payment from uh, students. And it's not a very good business model to say, look, I'm just going to teach you what you need to know and then you're off on your own, you know. <laughs> That's the, you're not setting yourself up for 10 years worth of income there. Um, well, it's, it's, it's what you, it's, it's used to the fish. So I can teach somebody to fish and they can get a fish, but I can also say to them, yeah, but you know what? They're a bigger fish, mm. but for a bigger fish, you'd have to be stronger. That's you'd so, have to have more technique. Yeah. So, so I think you and I are similar. We, we're quite, we're, we, we're kind of radically independent people and we like to do things ourselves um mm. but I, I have sought out tuition in strength training at different times so when i first started i went to the local gym and there was a guy who was a bodybuilder there and you know i got him to help me out and he then then one day i went to have a lesson with him and he was cutting weight for a competition and he, he couldn't think. He gave me a, an absolutely awful lesson. Um, I almost felt like I'd, it wasn't worth paying for because he couldn't concentrate. He couldn't think. He was a complete mess. And you could see the this, this skull coming through in his face. And he was saying, oh, this is when I know it's working, when you can actually see my skull. And he was eating between 12 and 24 eggs a day. And he'd been doing that for 20 years. And it was all about building muscle, cutting fat at the cost, no matter what the cost to his general health and lifestyle and effectiveness in the world. <clears throat> so when after that lesson, I thought, no, this is not the way I want to go. Um, but he taught me a lot of valuable things that I said, well, I'm going to keep those lessons. And I, I don't think what the, the other things that he's doing great for him that's what the most important thing in his life but it's not the most important thing in my life um so then i kind of worked with what i'd learned from him um and then a bit later on i 
started doing more body weight stuff and so all the stuff I do now is body weight and he was teaching me how to use free weights I came across a guy called Steve Maxwell who is uh he's in his 60s American guy and I think the reason why I sought him out was I realized that the if you're if you've got a yogic um instinct for exercise mm -hmm. like I do um what the best people to listen to are the old guys who are still who are in their 60s 70s or even 80s and in great shape because that's my that's my goal is that and the the guy in his 20s on steroids who looks like you know some uh you know looks like he-man probably not the best guy to get advice from if you're looking to do long term like you know a lifetime of of this mm. kind of practice mm. um so i started to get more interested in the physical culture movement of you know the old school strength training and uh came across um steve maxwell i think for a joe rogan podcast actually and i had a as um a skype call with him once as a christmas present from my wife and and I downloaded lots of programs that video programs he'd done. So, you know, I, I learned that. And then, oh, but, but I mean, prior to him, there have been other people I checked out and it's, and then there's going to be, there's other people I'm looking at now and learning from. But what I tend to do is I go to one teacher, learn some stuff from them. And then I spend, year, you know, one or two or three or four or five years putting into practice what I've learned from them. Decide what is working for me and what isn't. And then I'll look for another teacher. They will take me, you know, the next like the bigger fish in terms of mm. my own personal aims and goals and progress and uh, tendencies. Um, so even though I've never gone to a gym and I, I don't go to regular classes, I have sought out tuition at different times, but I've I've really wanted to put into practice what I've learned before going back to drink from the well again, you know, of, of mm. knowledge. Because I think it's, this is the same in so many fields of life. Too much knowledge is an impediment to actually doing stuff. You know, it's like you suddenly start thinking, oh, you know, are my elbows in exactly the right position? When did I eat? Is this the right time of day for working out? And, you know, all, all of those kind of things. And those are the kind of things that you obsess about in the beginning when you're learning something. But then as you go on, you start to realize what is important in what you want to get out of it and what isn't. Um, yeah, anyway, that's a, a bit of a... No, 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 it's, no, it's good. Because I, 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 I suppose what I was thinking about is... If, if there are these martial arts that are seen as spiritual martial arts, so, so yoga, for an example, or I was thinking about something like integral life practice or integral transform practice, right, yeah. where they're seen, yeah, all those sort of, where they're seen as things that, where spirituality is included within them, that the West might exclude because you can't really sell it. It's difficult to sell. When does so this is a question to myself so i'm at the moment i'm doing a lot of resistance band work and i quite like it because i quite like the I, I, i'm not keen on free weights because I, I don't like the sort of emptiness feel of free weights what, what, what i like about resistance bands is you can feel the pull you're pulling towards or pulling away from something when does it become a spiritual practice how, when did it become for me something that I see as not just a physical act, a, a gross body physical activity to get bigger and stronger and all those things? When does it become a thing that I do because I see it as a non dual thing? Mm. Now, I'm remembering our last conversation. I think you said your spiritual practice is running yeah but i don't know when it became that it, I, I suppose what i'm trying to thinking about is if somebody was listening and, and this and we're saying well you've got this thing called running it's not a spiritual practice in a sense of it's it's not you it's not something that is 
like yoga where it is a spiritual practice but they're taking the spirituality out of it so it can be marketed in a particular way running is just since running how does somebody decide this afternoon to go for a run and shift it from an egoic how quicker can i do 5k to a subtle how do i notice what i'm doing mm. so that the distance and the speed become less important they're, they're markers of fitness as opposed to markers of efficacy yeah. of egoic efficacy so it's important for me to know what my fitness levels are so i can monitor my things the data is useful but it's not something that is used to say look how good i am or look how strong i am or it's it's more about constantly getting data to make sure i'm okay yeah when does it become, when do I shift into a spiritual dimension in my running? And is it possible to, sh to be able to express to somebody how they could do that? Yeah. I mean, I think that the simpler you make it, the less authentic to the actual experience it is. But I was just, the, the simplest way I could describe it is bringing into focus the gross, the subtle and the causal aspects of the experience um that you know the, the the sort of standard western model is just to focus on the gross experience the the gross mm. physical experience of it but the uh, we've already talked about the that kind of causal formlessness uh you know the headless experience but just as a footnote i think the, the more i've done the headless experience it's not so much like like a headless thing it's I have no torso either. It, I actually feel it more. It, it's my head and my torso, my heart area is where I feel everything um, mm -hmm. rather than just in the head. And I think when you start doing the headless stuff, it, it can feel like it's really located in your your head. But I, for me, it's become a bit more of a whole body thing. Um, uh, but the, so the thing we, we haven't quite explored um, is the, is this subtle energy thing and you touched onto it when it with the breath and the rhythm of the breath and i think that's one of the the things that i've really built up a relationship with through doing this work is breathing the rhythm of breathing and that special there's a, something very special about breathing because it, it it sits on this convergence point between voluntary and involuntary Mm. And it, it requires a very, very subtle and nuanced relationship to, to have that not be purely involuntary or purely voluntary. You know, I think, um, and we've talked about this before, there is actually no such thing as voluntary breathing ultimately because, you know, you hold your breath long enough, you, you're, you're not going to be able to stop yourself taking a breath after, say, three minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's that subjective feeling of it being voluntary. Um, and, and I think one of the significant lessons learned from that is that I heard Tim Freak. Do you know, have you heard of Tim Freak? Mm -hmm. yeah, he came up with this coined this term univigil which i really like it's a kind of the convergence of that universal aspect of ourselves the spiritual transpersonal with the individual our personality our you know skin encapsulated mm -hmm. ego type of thing and you know that that kind of tantric experience of the convergence of the transpersonal and personal the spiritual and egoic is 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 delivered very instinctively by breathing and and it, i think subtle is a very good word for the for breath um mm. because it it's it, it is it, it's a delicate relationship you know when you're doing something i have done for a long time is meditating on my breath you know that kind of vipassana tradition is one of the types of meditation i do and it just it's again endlessly fascinating just co every time i do it i'm learning more and it becomes more refined and more subtle um mm. that relationship i mean i know subtle energies aren't just to do with breath 
but pranayama chi and, and all of that stuff they they breath is definitely a, a large part of it if i was running with somebody if i was coaching somebody in running would i coach them in breath running or would i coach them in running so it's it's a it's a quandary i always have because i've done it where i've worked with people it still feels to me like it leaves open the sense of something something missing oh i get it i've got it so one of the things that we've not talked about is purposefulness as a thing that drives everything that we're doing and can that purposefulness be so loose that it doesn't have to have a fixed form yeah just that, so I th what's coming up for me is meaning something being meaningful just in and of itself rather than the meaning being the result. Does that sound, is that too abstract? It does. No, 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 it's fine. But I, I'm wondering if there's something there about presupposing that there's a thing that brings, that we have to find meaning of. I, I think we, it feels to me that we, we, we have to, I think we might have to avoid a kind of, um, privileged state that because of the way in which we encounter the world and because of the kind of personalities we have we can do things in such a way that might mean that other people would find it really difficult to do what we do because I think we do things with a purpose that doesn't have meaning I can't really, I can't tell, I, I, initially I did it, initially I started in, when I got to 50, I did it because I realised that I'd done it for so long, but I was losing traction on it, so I wanted to gain traction on it. I'm not quite sure what the meaning was in that. I don't know if it was an egoic meaning or a spiritual meaning. I'm not quite sure what I was trying to mean by doing that. And I think, but for me, it, the purpose felt like keeping something purposeful through the life that I'd had and realising as I got older, I would become, I would have less purpose in a sense, less ability to do it because I just wouldn't be able to recover enough. So I wanted to create a space where the purposefulness of what I was doing was the purpose of being a human being, which is keeping oneself healthy. But somebody that might go off and start doing exercises and we're wanting to promote ex Western exercise, a spiritual dimension, it would seem to me that they have to let go of a purpose of doing something without purpose and that's really difficult mm. well I, I, see if this lands for you uh so this what's coming up for me is that that a vibrant healthy body is the purpose of mother nature it's what yes. she does. It's what she does. It's what she loves. And it's a bit like when you say in Michelangelo revealing the sculpture that you do, you do this exercise to reveal mother nature's beauty inside your, your own self. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a, that is a, that's a transpersonal purpose. It takes you beyond yourself. So, so when I do, when I work out, because I've done a lot of voice dialogue training, when I do a workout, in this in the spirit of voice dialogue i say i don't even consciously say this anymore but it's like this is for the next half hour my body's going to take center stage you know not my thinking mind or whatever you know it's and um on 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 its own terms not not the terms of my ego or my thinking mind or whatever it's just but at the same time, I'm not just saying, right, my body takes center stage. This is like mother nature, uh, you know, biology, just 
I mean, I, I'm reducing it again to the, that purely physical thing, just for simplicity's sake, but just Mother Nature take the stage here. And, it, it, you know, it comes into to diet as well, that when... Um, I mean, I know we have these evolutionary drives to crave fat, salt and sugar, and that's a natural thing, and it is Mother Nature, but it's, it's, there's this enormous momentum coming through us towards health um that when we get out of the way of that so to speak um it's inherently meaningful and purposeful it's like it's almost like evolution's purpose or so you know to think of it in that kind of third person sense of the word but mm. i i when mm. i step into that i am no longer just ralph cree doing my thing i am mother nature i am the everything the transpersonal the universe well maybe that's probably getting a bit abstract no 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 i don't i think you're absolutely right i, I no i think you're right i think it, it it's about it's about seeing exercise as a way of bringing oneself back into ecology hmm. and i think that's that, that that's what seems to happen what I and again I'm I'm deeply biasly gener, generalizing here about gyms and things or my experience of gyms is that what a what a gym tends to do is remove the human being from the ecology yeah. by kind of creating sort of um, anthropocentric notion of there's you yeah. and there's these weights or this gym or whatever that is and there's these these eggs you eat and the protein you eat and the supplements you eat but what miss what's missing in all of that is exercise is a way of bringing ourselves back into modern into a kind of nature mysticism ecology if my my ecology is not different from mother nature's ecology from the ecology of the world from gaia exercise i've got it exercise it's a way in which i can reconnect back to gaia yeah time I've and time to, again you know it's a repetitive yeah, yeah. it's a touchstone you know it's yeah just, yeah yeah that's mm -hmm. it and it's it's to do with the fact that I have this ecology, which is my body. And there are three different systems in that ecology. There's a gross, subtle and causal system. And what I'm attempting to do is create an ecology of those systems so they work in unity. Mm. I am looking at my unity of breathing, the ecology of my breathing. I'm thinking about things like the, the nutrients that I'm putting into my body. I'm thinking about health, I'm thinking about sleeping. I'm thinking about stress management, all those things I am deeply, deeply thinking about rather than, and you said, it's just originally, rather than extracting and mining things out to myself for some sort of profit of egoic surplus value of saying, look at me, I've got a big chest. What I'm doing is I'm deeply aware of myself as an ecological being in an ecology of self, mm. which brings me back to the purpose of being part of nature. And I think that um, you know, when we say, well, you know, what is it? What is it to be? So one of the ways I define spiritual practice is is anything that expands your sense of identity. So in this sense, what you're describing there, through exercise, um, something as seemingly mundane and simple as exercise, we're expanding our sense of identity to become an ecology of selves. If I think of a voice dialogue, mm. it's based around this idea that we are multiple selves. We're not just one monolithic persona or mm. going self. And that the kind of mainstream view of, of exercise in our culture uh, in society is that it is this monolithic one thing. You know, it's just you just make your body do something and it makes you look and feel good. Um Whereas we're expanding it to incorporate more and more of life and perspectives into it so that it's, it is, it is the physical sensations, it's the breathing, it's the diet, and it becomes a virtuous circle that, you know, when you start doing your exercising, you get, you want to eat better food and you want to dedicate more time to sleeping and resting and all of the other things. And it's suddenly, it, it kind of, 
it's like a kind of mycelial net network that just starts to, it it teaches you it teaches it's taught me in a very very direct way the interconnectedness of everything that that it's not you don't just do your exercise because you know as anybody who does this stuff knows if you don't eat the right food your exercise is kind of pissing in the wind um mm -hmm. you know and you could eat loads and loads of good food but never do any exercise again pissing in the wind and if you don't get enough sleep you're not recovering enough and you're not gonna you know your your body's not going to change and you know you realize that it's this systems view it's that ecological systemic view of who we are that broadens us out mm. um, and I don't mean systemic just in that third person objective sense of no, no, I don't. it's actually a subjective feeling of wow I am all of these things and they and they stretch so far beyond my persona or ego or whatever that you know um yeah do you, so it's interesting because i was beginning to think about the, the the idea that if all those things are real oh, and, and you and i both had experiences of those things as real we, we have the, the evidence if you will i wonder if there's something about the intuitive understanding of exercise as a threshold into that which may cause people to read a novel while they're running on a treadmill. Can you, that, can you that say that again? Yeah. Exercise, if we, for me, exercise is the thing that happens that grows me into that ecology that expands myself, that goes beyond myself. But that's really quite frightening. I'm speaking almost like a therapist now in a sense. Mm. That's really quite frightening to propose that this thing that you are doing can remove all the occluding dimensions of yourself to have a greater sense of yourself. But in having a greater sense of yourself, that challenges the whole notion of who you are. So you know, it, it changes how you eat, it changes how you sleep, it changes how you are in relationships because everything becomes a process of health management so i begin to think about making sure that i maintain healthy relationships it may change my relationship to work so just this notion of going out and running or doing free body weights or doing resistance band just just taking the band and pulling it is a moment when i can say i could be more than i am but that would affect everything that i am yeah. this 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 might change your whole life <laughs> yeah yeah. Like, so want that. instinctively, want, yeah, instinctively want, knowing that. Well, I was going to say that. It, it, do you want the universe to come crashing into your life? Uh, that's the point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do 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 you want liberation hmm. from all those things that? So that there's a there's a feeling almost that if that's instinctive in people, is one of the reasons why they they might want to be with a personal trainer because a personal trainer then controls the nature of the world for them or when they get on a treadmill and they get the magazine out they put the music on they are deliberately removing that moment they're keeping it annexed if you will they're, they're saying i'm going to keep this 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 is exercise is it good for me it's important for me everybody tells it's good it's good for your mental health but i'm going to keep it as small as possible the smallest smallest space in my life i'll do it and I'll, I'll do it in a way that I do it regularly, but I'm going to keep these things around it. Keep it because if I let these, if, because if I let it go and it suddenly becomes me, then I become more than I know that I am. Yeah. It and feels I, quite terrifying. It is. And I think, I think this is one of the things I wanted to talk about that this repetitive nature of coming back time and time again to not shying away from discomfort and intensity. So, um, and, and that's scary. So, uh, you know, you, um, I've been a psychotherapeutic client of yours for about 14 years or something. And, you know, look, the work that you do with me is about you know, bringing me back to my emotional discomfort. Mm. 
And so mm. that, 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 like I'm like a like a baby crawling away from <laughs> it. It's like okay, come on, you know, but it's just you know, it's sort of running away from it. It's not you know, it's not going to bite you. You know, it's, and so this is the, one of the wider beneficial in, implications of, for me of of doing many years regular strength training practice um, of voluntarily going into discomfort and not and and learning to go deeper into discomfort i mean i think these throughout your life you get better at doing this um and the wider impact that that again has spilled out into the rest of my life and it's so you know it's quite it's, it's like a trendy phrase in the psychotherapeutic world of turn towards your discomfort behind the dragon the dragon hides, uh, hides the gold and all of that sort of thing <clears throat> and we desperately want to get the gold without having to face the dragon and it can be it can be quite a kind of conceptual game it's just words are cheap you know it's like oh yeah i turn towards my discomfort turn towards your discomfort oh look they're turning towards their discomfort 10 years ago i turned towards my discomfort and blah blah, blah you know um but when you're doing it time and time again with your body in a tote there's no bullshit there's no conceptualizing this bypass spiritual bypassing it none of that stuff when you are on at the max it, say you're, you're you're doing let's say you're doing press ups or something you're right at the limit of your ability to do another rep that's the that's the, the, the you know the zone we're talking about and you can't if you bypass that you just stop doing it but yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. Uh, if you if you start conceptualizing it you you can't it's just th this is a moment that does not lie and i love that about it um you you can't play mental games with that moment it, it just it is what it is and it's so simple and direct and you know when you've when you have not been authentic in that moment you know when you've lied to yourself and said oh i couldn't have done any more you know you or something like that and doing that several times a week for years on end it, it, it bakes that into your life you know yeah it, it's just interesting I was thinking about the the year where i decided to have a cold shower every day for five days and and people would say well what did you get from it and, and the, the, the wim hoff community would say oh, did, did you experience what did you experience and i couldn't ever really describe what i experienced and what i realized is i was doing it because i just wanted to be discomforted mm. well that, I, I, I think I, that, that's the that's what makes this a yogic ex a, um a yogic a, a, a approach in the widest sense that, that yoga is basically and i'm not just talking about physical yoga i'm talking about no. bhakti yoga jnana mm -hmm. yoga raja yoga um what else we got karma yoga those four core yogas that come from the indian tradition they are all about moving into the uncomfortable zone in yourself all the multiple dimensions of ourselves um, but maybe there's something for me i think it's it's about i'm not that's a strange thing i'm not interested in the gold i'm hmm. just interested in the breath of the dragon and, and and it's all it, it, and i think that's another thing that exists in exercise i'm not doing it to get to the i'm not doing discomfort to get to my gold i'm doing discomfort because i like being discomfort i like I, I, for me i guess it's a bit like it's it's the whole thing is it's like the don't take enlightenment to or enlighten there's a discomfort there knowing that you could do something but you're not going to do it you're deliberately going to keep yourself in discomfort because by, in, by being in discomfort, you're more alive. Mm. So for me, it's always about just creating spaces where I feel discomfort mm. and, and not thinking this discomfort will lead me to my gold or I will be well, a dragon. I think, I think one of the things I've learned and has fundamentally changed my approach to exercise and all spiritual practice is that you start off thinking, right, well, I'm going to get to that pot of gold. 
you get to that pot of gold and you realize that there's just there's more gold there's just dragons and gold forever and it's not like and, and it's not like level one level two level three level four level five level six it's 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 an a uh, smooth there's sort of like a smooth gradient um unending and so my i don't ha like i mean i could say my goal is to be a fit healthy and strong old man but it's not really it's just it's this unending exploration of the infinite or something i mean it's um and and that all of a sudden because you realize it's it's an infinite game you stop running towards the goals um and it because it's infinite you can't run towards something that suddenly the only way to the only way to go is now and this moment and what's happening uh, if that makes sense yeah yeah it does it's interesting I, I i don't have goals but i would think that when i exercise i always exercise to fatigue mm. and, yeah. And, and, yeah yeah i i, I know it's, it's it's sounds kind of slightly counterintuitive but every exercise is a fatigue exercise because i want to see i, I want to always make sure that i am putting myself in a space where i can go beyond myself yeah uh, i i love the fact you brought that up because when i first started working out the i was using numbers of repetitions and numbers of sets and all of that stuff and and it was like oh you know could i do 10 this time or could i do 11 but I don't even count reps and unless I'm doing, um, you know, like single leg exercises, I know I want to do the same number of reps on each leg. Mm. Otherwise I'd be walking around in circles, but I don't really count repetitions. The gauge of when it's time to stop is I cannot do any more. And mm. the good thing about that as a, as a kind of metric for when you're at the right place is that you're actually going with how your body and your mind and emotions are on that particular day you know it's, it depends on how well you slept how much you've eaten mm. rather than say right well i've got to do 10 every day that's just that's a kind of conceptual um platonic idea of like the form of the exercise and you're mm. not actually in dialogue with yourself like how are you actually feeling today in this moment you know and so i i feel momentary muscular failure or that mo that fatigue is the is the place you you know is is, is the, the 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 most authentic gauge of when it's when it's enough <laughs> yeah it, 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 it's similar to the, with running i don't i set off to run and i get a sense of how i feel and allow that to motivate the running so I don't, I, I, I mean, time constraints and things like that, but I will decide on the intensity of the running in the moment of how I feel, because it seems to be much more intuitive to work like that. With, with the resistance bands, I have to be aware that as I move in towards six day, I have to push my body into constantly muscle activity. So I tend to use repetitions primarily because I increase weight um, just so I can keep the muscle actively going. And it feels to me a much more instinctive way of working because I want to make sure that, the, the, that I'm aware that I'm keeping the muscle in tension. And, but at the same time, I've got to make sure that there's little rests between but with running, it's really just about how I feel in the moment. There's a type of strength training exercise I really love called isometric work. Mm. Where you you don't move. And this is the, I, I love it and I hate it at the same time. So basically you go to the, the point in a particular exercise when it is the hardest. 
So if it was a squat, for example, you would go into the position where your thighs are basically parallel with the floor and you hold that position until you can't hold it anymore. And it's an amazing meditative mm. uh, experience because it just, it, so when you're moving, you can kind there's something slightly distracting about moving. You know, it's like you can focus on the movement and not so much on the, the discomfort sometimes. Mm, yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas when you're doing an isometric exercise, there's no movement. It is just uncomfortable. <laughs> and it's just it's about how deep are you going to go into that sensation in this moment? Um, and it's something I've been doing for about five years. I kind of rotate it with, with other types of exercise. Um, but it, it's really powerful. And I think it's unpopular. It, 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 was, it was more popular in the old days, you know, with the... Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even heard an amazing story about um, a guy who was a prisoner of war uh, in World War II, and he was literally chained to a wall and um, in a cell, and he was a circus strongman. And he just did isometric training by pulling on his chains in different positions to build up his strength enough to actually break his chains. And he escaped uh, his cell. Um, and uh, I mean, he was caught and brought back, but I think he escaped his, his cell a couple of times. Like, and that was all he had, you know? And um, yeah. Well, there's a, there's a line, isn't there, in, um, Rock, in Rocky and Frank Furt sings a line about, um, he talks about dynamic tension because he's, he's talking about Rocky, his creation. And he says, you know, he's got dynamic tension. Dynamic tension was the way in which people exercise that kind of asymmetric work, but it's actually a line in the song to, re to represent how, is it Steve Reeves? How bodybuilders used to bodybuild, they used to build and build in dynamic tension or asymmetric work. Mm. Do you think that we are painting a picture of spiritual, of westernized spiritual practice exercise that seems to be quite masochistic? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't, well, so when you say masochistic, uh, I think when I, th when I think of Mother Nature, th there is something masochistic about Mother Nature, you know? It's, mm. nature is, is, is raw. And, you know, I sometimes kind of think that it's like Mother Nature is 51% gorgeous and 49% um the horrible the devout you know 49 percent the devouring mother 51 percent the generative mother you know um and i th i think you know the, the the masochistic thing is you know i mean one thing we haven't talked about is injuries and i am not interested so this this was something i learned at some point that i'm not interested in doing sport I did tons of sport when I was young and I got loads and loads of injuries. It was lots of fun. I really enjoyed it, but I got so many injuries and I'm at a point in my life. I'm 43 now. I don't really want to be dealing with lots of injuries in my life. And um, I, I, I'm doing this as a generative exercise. And there was a time uh, about four years ago or something when I started learning uh, gymnastic rings Oh, the rings yeah and yeah. i damaged my shoulder really badly mm. and i i had to take uh eight months off completely with no exercise for eight months the reason was because i injured my shoulder but i was so enjoying the sport of gymnastic rings that i couldn't stop doing it and even though so i injured my shoulder and i continued to do another two two months of training with an injured shoulder of the gymnastic rings because I loved it, uh, the sport. And I just kept going until I literally could not go anymore. And then I had to do nothing for eight months. And that experience 
was humiliating. I learned a lot about my ego and all of those kind of things. Um, and I and I came out of that experience realizing that I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't want to do sports anymore. Um, and I was, which is that slightly masochistic. There's something slightly masochistic about that sporting approach. You know, I'm thinking of. I listened to an interview with Louis, Louis Simmons. You know, the power lifter. Do you know mm. that, that guy? Um, I think it was an interview with Joe Rogan. And he has trashed his body. Like, he detached his bicep a while back, but because he never uses his bicep, he does bench press, squat, and deadlift. He's never bothered to have it reattached. He's got, um, he's had a shoulder replacement. He's got this thing where if he tips his head back, he blacks out and faint and passes out. So he, he can't look up <laughs> and I mean, he's had all, so his body is a complete mess. And Joe Rogan was saying, um, you know, would you, would you do anything differently? You know, if you were to rewind the tape of your life and he said, no, I absolutely loved every moment of my life. I don't care that I've screwed my body up. It was just all about that kind of masochistic sport approach. Um, yeah, so I think so the, the, I mean, that, that was quite a ramble I've just been on, but no, no, it's fine. Can I just, can I just, saying. yeah, sure. Can I just check? I, I don't think I understand when you say when you were in the rings. Mm. When does that stop being exercise and become sport? Yeah, it's quite a difficult thing to define, but I think most people can could understand the difference, just generally kind of grok the difference between doing a sport and just exercising. Um, but I, I'll try and unpack it that, well, so if I think about my own approach, I'm interested in going into discomfort through exercise as a as a generative activity that makes my body stronger healthier less prone to injury and uh, delivers me into these experiences of transpersonalness and all of that kind of thing whereas a sport you just to get better and better and better and better at the sport, you're pushing yourself to kind of beyond the limits of safety, perhaps, where the risk of injury is quite high. Um, you know, people that do a lot of sport, particularly professional athletes, are basically constantly managing injuries. So, but by sport, You're speaking of the activity as competition. Yeah, yeah, that's in, yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, I'm not talking about a sport for the love of it, where you're not, you know, so taking large risks, you know, to your body. So, say, you know, you could do you could do snowboarding, for example. Um, push yourself but be be quite safe about it or you could do off piste stuff and that where the in risk of injury and death is quite high um or yeah i don't know i mean it's it is it, it, it's quite difficult it's quite a subtle thing to talk about and i haven't and I, it's just yeah, unpacked it before i think it's really important what you're saying because In in the coaching training for running, it's a sport, the sport of running. And yet, I've never seen anything I do as a sport. In fact, I'm anti-sport. I, I don't like sport. I mean, I watch sports, if you will. But I don't, I've not, I've never done anything as a sport. I've, I've, I did the running because it seemed to me the, the best way of burning calories, but it wasn't a sport as such. And I'm wondering if there's something about 
the inherent description of westernized physical activity as sport that limits its capacity to be seen as a meditative practice because it's a sport that I'm doing. What's your sport? My sport is golf. Or what's your sport? My sport is running. What's your sport? My sport is weight training. That it becomes a category of activities that are limited by the nature of the sport, as opposed to an activity that actually creates less limit by making it making us by going back to that e ecological notion of it's a set of activities that we undertake to place ourselves in discomfort to discover more about ourselves. And I, th I think the, another thing to bring into this is that you, the sweet spot for you is where your edge is, not somebody else's. And when we talk about sports, you say, oh, I play rugby. Someone would say, oh, what team do you play for? Or I play golf. What's what's your what's it called in golf? Your average? Yeah, what, your handicap. What's your handicap? Um, you know, I I snowboard. Uh, what coloured slopes do you snowboard on? Or uh, you know, there's that. You know, that becomes part of the conversation when you talk about sport, not just. It's almost like embarrassing for people to say, "I don't give a shit what level I'm at." I just do it because I love it and I'm always slightly leaning into my own edge. You know, people would say, oh, that's yeah, yeah, I see that. that yeah, sounds yeah, kind yeah, of a bit, yeah. a bit of feet or something, you know, it's, it's yeah, not... yeah, yeah. But then, but then that's, that's where it becomes, it would become very difficult for somebody to transition from sport into ecology because in the ecology, there's nothing to report back. Because it's the ecology, it's the thing, isn't it? It, it? There's nothing outside of it. Like you, like you sort of rolled off to the universe. Yeah. There, there's, 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 no, there's no umpire standing outside the universe saying, comments saying, oh, now everybody, Gary Hawk is now one with, one with the universe. You know, it's like, you know what I mean? It's when you become one with everything, nobody can comment on that other than you. <laughs> You know, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah. there's no like, yeah. oh, this this is a Gary Hawk is now at the level eight universe experience. So you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Whereas the, the the sport, you have some external assessment. It's like, oh, there's this guy plays for the Premier League, or you know. Yeah, that, that's that's yeah, and I can see, but that I can see how that makes it a challenge to move from that sport to ecology because in the ecology that there's got to be an awakening to a greater sense of self prior to that move. Because the greater sense of self comes from the umpire telling you where you are. <gasps> I've got it. I've got it. You have to become your own umpire. Yeah. But trust that your that your criteria are correct. Yeah. And you've always got to be skeptical. So this, this is, you know, one really interesting thing. Maybe this could be the final point we bring up because we're kind of running out of time. That um, to always be skeptical about your own assessment of what you're doing and, and not skeptical in the sense of developing a super ego that just bashes you the whole time. You know, it's like, no, you're not doing it right. Uh, you're lying to yourself, blah, blah, blah. But when all you've got is your own self-reporting and this this feeds into uh, you know mystical state experiences and stuff you know you, you read some book of some mystic that lived a hundred years ago they had some experience they self-report it to some other people and then in the chinese whispers thing the other people think that they make their own conclusions about that person's self-reporting. They write it down in a book. And then a hundred years later, I pick up that book and I'm making up my own assumptions and conclusions about what this person's original mm. state experience was. And it's all we're going from was that person's self-reporting originally. Um, you know, this is one of the great problems with spiritual traditions and practices and gurus and all of that stuff is, a lot of the time, all you've got to go on is somebody just telling you what their own experience of life or this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got to trust yeah. them. Um, 
but you know you have your own self story about what you're doing with your exercise or yogic practice or meditation or whatever it is psychotherapy and you know it takes a lot i think you 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 learn a lot about authenticity and honesty through through this long term relationship with the practice as an art form you know you kind of yeah, you know, you sort of you 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 know when you're bullshitting yourself, or you know when you're being unfair and trying to push yourself like a slave driver. You know, it's yeah. Well, you're 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 sort of constantly trying to notice your bias and then ask questions as to how that bias arose. So, the I was thinking about. The, I was thinking about doing the cold showering. That I have a bias that cold that cold water is cold, but it's such a deep inhaled cold. cold it's such a deep inhaled cold bias that to suddenly get in, stand on naked under a cold shower for five minutes in midwinter, and it's horribly horribly cold and it's horribly horribly painful. I'm really working against asking questions of myself about what I'm doing. I know it's a kind of scientific thing rather than take the bias that I can't do it, is to step 100 and see what happens if I do. What do I discover in myself? What do I note about myself? What am I not seeing? It's, a, it's, almost, like, it's almost like having a kind of um, hawk's tie, you know, the, the, the thing that they use in tennis, just constantly what's checking what, what's that? hawk's eye. Is it hawk's eye? Oh, oh, the thing that, that sees if a ball goes out or not. Yeah. Yeah, it's that sort of, it's that sense of, of not because I don't really know how it happened. It's having this overview of yourself, constantly questioning where you're at and what you're doing. Because what you want to do is you want to gain more sense of who you are by recognizing that you don't know very much about yourself. So place yourself in a situation where the discomfort draws you into knowing more about yourself. Mm. So you're constantly questioning all the time. Yeah. And then you can take that idea of the world, use that as the way that you can question the world. Mm. That, that we don't, just because somebody says, this is what you should be doing, we don't have to accept that without, first of all, questioning what's the should be or why it's there or what's the reason for it. We don't accept things blindly. And I think that's what ex the way I exercise does. It, it, treat, it, it, it enables me to think about things, not from a blind perspective, but from an unknown perspective. Hmm. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. You know, I've, I've never, I actually haven't had a conversation like this about exercise before. <laughs> yeah, it's good. And, um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And it was a bit, I kind of stopped doing team sports and stuff at the age of about 18. And then I went into this kind of wild man time in nature with lots of hiking and all of that kind of thing. But I, I kind of missed a, a disciplined art form of a physical art form. Mm. And I kind of, I shopped around quite a bit, you know, it was like tried a bit of yoga, a bit of qigong, tai chi, that kind of thing. And I was really surprised to find how much I loved strength training. I never imagined I would take up strength training as an activity and love it and find so much depth and richness in it. Um, and I'm really thankful for having discovered it. It's, it's made such a benefit it's had been such a benefit to my life um and um you know i hope that people can listen to this conversation when they may have become disillusioned perhaps with the type of exercise they're doing and they're not they're kind of losing a bit of the meaning that you know why am i doing this and i hope that this can point people towards the the you know the depth of, of the art form of this and um mm. there's so much to explore here and it's really exciting it's a it's an exciting journey um it's a here it's a hero's it, it's a, it, this is it, this is your own hero's journey you know very very simple absolutely yeah. Yeah. Direct ways. yeah yeah 
But it's interesting. I, I, I was always touched by will because I do the simple feeling of being. Mm. And I think that if we strip away everything, we re remove sport or remove personal trainers or remove, remove everything away and we just strength exercise. Or str it's just about, it's the simple feeling of being in your being. Mm. And, and it, as, long, it's, as long as we stay with that in any time when we're exercising, exercising becomes a powerful tool for transformation. It's when we, we, we apply all the sort of capitalist notion on it of you know, da, 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 I've got to be bigger, I've got to be strong, I've got to be faster. Remove all those things. It's a simple feeling of being and it's just, it's just a fabulous liberation. Yeah. I think you can draw an analogy with Chogyam Trumpa's concept of spiritual materialism. You know, it's... Mm. You know, if you read that book, and he's basically saying the same thing about spiritual practices, you know, like meditation, and we have this growing up in Western society, we have a lot of momentum uh, diverting our attention towards all of those, you know, exterior aspects of it, you know, get the right yoga pants and yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. expensive yeah. mat yeah. and, you yeah. know, get the best trainer and blah, 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 all that stuff. And, you know, um, there's this whole deeper level to it, which, which is just there waiting to be explored. Mm. And it's profoundly simple. Yeah. So if, if people want to find out more about um, your work, you know, perhaps the, the running stuff. I mean, I don't know if you've, have you, have you written any blog posts or stuff? No, there's, there, there's a, I, I wrote some years ago that there's a, a post that I think is on a, a magazine that I now think is defunct where I think I was called the running man. But there's, <laughs> I'm not, I've never, one of my favorite never, Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. <laughs> no, I'm not running man. Um, no, I've never, I've never really thought through writing about the running as a practice because I think it's because it's 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 kind of quite a personal thing. Mm. So there's nothing. It's something I should do. I've never really approached thinking about what I do exercise wise as something to promote really because it's mine. I think it's about it's, it's it's my small practice really, and I've never extended it to communicate. But in fact, this is the first conversation I've really had about it. But um, you know, you do online coaching and in-person coaching. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if people, if, if people want to know about me, I, I have a website. It's garyhawk.org, mm. and there's lots of things on there, and there's people can contact me through there. Yeah. And I mean, the, the relationship you and I've had has been mainly based around psycho psychotherapeutic relationship. Mm. Um, but that's not the only thing you help people with. No. So if, if for example, so what tends to happen is, is that people will contact me and say, um, I'm, I'm thinking, so let me think of recently. Somebody recently contacted me and said, I, I, I want to get back, I want to try to run a marathon. Could you, could you come and help me out? So... I, what what tends to happen there is that I have a particular way of working, which is that it has to be kind of psycho spiritual therapeutic running. So it's not just about training people to run, but it's looking at all the sort of psychological structures that get in the way of the running. It's about it's one of the emotions. It's about thinking about the breath. So it's kind of an holistic coach into running. Now, what tends to happen is people will ring me up and say, "Have you got an availability?" But I've, I've never gone out my way to advertise it but it's something that i do but it's people tend to find me yeah and i think um i mean i can speak to this from the psychotherapeutic work i've done with you it's, it's you know going back to that bit in the conversation where if you're going to work with gary be prepared for a collision with the infinite <laughs> 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 it's, um, it's, it's, it, 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 yeah. and it's 60 I, I, minutes of cold showering yeah I, I love one of the terms i that you use a lot when we work together that i absolutely love is um welcome to the mysterium yeah, yeah. It, it really sums yeah. it up and it's it's brilliant yeah so, it's yeah. good it, and that's why i find it very difficult to explain what i do because it is really it's about 
going into the mysterium and see what happens and then try and track it yeah cool well thank you so much gary that's uh, okay thank you i've really enjoyed it yeah yeah me too and uh i will speak to you soon and yep. uh, you take care of yourself today. yeah we will do you take care all right goodbye cheers Thanks. bye thank you bye I made all the music that I use in my podcasts. If you'd like to hear more of my music, please visit SoundCloud and check out my profile, Ralph Free.